Okay, so we start uh, this course with the chapter one, uh, and it's the Anbana theorem and applications. So let us um, look at this theorem. So you consider a linear space X over R. So you're familiar with these objects. A linear space uh, is a space which is stable by addition of his elements and uh, multiplication by, um, for example, R. So here it's a linear space on, over R. So we will consider also linear spaces over C, uh, the space of complex number, okay? So X is a linear space over R. And then you have P. P is a real function defined on X. Uh, so for example, uh, an example of X will be R to the N. Okay, so there's not so much assumptions to do in this theorem. First, P is not linear, is not a linear function. But uh, if A is a positive real number, uh, A is positive, but it's, the assumption is A, A belongs to R, then P of AX equals A P of X. Next, you have the sub additivity assumption, which is P of X plus Y is less than P of X plus P of Y. So what the Anbana theorem is about? It's about, now you consider a linear functional, so meaning it's a linear function defined on a subspace Y of X. It's not defined all over X. It's defined on a subspace smaller, smaller than X. And satisfies on this subspace, subspace Y, that L of Y is less than P of Y. Then the conclusion is that L can be extended to all of X. Furthermore, on X, you, you have also that L of X is less than P of X. So, now we're going to prove the Anbana theorem. And in order to prove this theorem, uh, we need what's, what is called the Zorn's lemma, right? So the Zorn's lemma states that if S is a partially ordered set, so we, we're going to see what's, what's the meaning of that, such that every totally ordered, you, you see you have partially ordered and then you have totally ordered. So you have a partially ordered set. And within this set S, you have that every totally ordered subset of S has an upper bound. Then S has a maximal element. So we will see that with the theorem, we will going we will be able to prove uh, the theorem one, which is the Anbana theorem. Okay, to understand Zorn's lemma, we need to define uh, so this kind of intuitive but uh, 
we need to see exactly what we are talking about. So first, what's a partially ordered set? A partially ordered set is a set where you define an order, but in this, with this order, you can't, or it's not necessary that you can compare every pair of elements. Okay, so you define an order relation A less than B for some, but not necessarily all pairs A, B within S. And so you have transitivity. So if you can compa compare A and B, so if A is less than B and B is less than C, then A is less than C. And reflexivity meaning that A is less than A. Now, a subset T of S is totally ordered if, if for X and Y, for all X and Y in T, you can com compare them. So you have either X less than Y or, or Y less than X. Now, an element U of S is an upper bound for T if when X is in T, then you have X which is less than U. All right, so uh, U is an U is in S, right? Uh, not necessarily in T. U is in S, but it's an upper bound for T if it is greater than all of elements of T. That's an upper bound. Whereas a maximal element M of S satisfies satisfies. So if B, B is also in S. So if M is less than B, then this implies that M equals B. All right, so, uh, so M is the biggest element and it, it, it belongs to um, S, of course. All right. So with those defini definitions and um, along with the Zorn lemma, we can now prove the Anbana theorem. So uh, let's do that. Um, okay, so let's do that. Uh, yeah, no, before going into the proof, I just a uh, little example. So to illustrate uh, those definitions, uh, let's consider an interval, a bounded interval, a closed bounded interval in R. So A, B. So now if you look at um, the totally ordered subsets of S, they all have an upper bound in S. Yeah, think about it, think about it. And S admits a maximal element, which is B, right? If you assume that um, some number is in S and greater than B, it must be B. So, uh, yeah, we are in the application of Zorn's lemma. However, now if you if you take out the B of S, then it's not true that uh, the totally ordered sets of S have an upper bound. All right. So I I invite you to to think more about this. Uh, this is a, an example, right? To to make things 
a little bit more concrete. So now the proof. So we'll first apply Zorn's lemma. So this part is kind of very natural, okay? Uh, you just need to define what is your order. And in fact, it's a partial order. So, um, so what's, what's this order and the, the partially ordered set, or they call it sometimes poset, so you have a, so I, I recall that in the theorem, you have a Y. So Y is where your linear functional L is defined. So now you, you, are, you are considering uh, new elements that are Y prime. So Y prime are subspaces of X, but that are, that contain y, they are bigger than y. And then you define for a such y prime, you define l prime such that uh, l prime equals l on y. And you, you, Assume also that L prime is smaller than P on y, y prime. So now you have new elements. And now on these uh, new elements, you will uh, define an order as follows. Uh, if you have two, uh, so L1, Y1, and L2, Y2, uh, you say that L1, Y1 is less than L2, Y2 if Y2 is, Y1, Y2 contains Y1 and L1 equals L2 on Y1. Now, if you uh, define, if you have a totally ordered subset of S, you define L bar, Y bar. So how do you define L bar, Y bar? L let's start with Y bar. So for Y bar, you take the union of all Y prime, such Y prime, L prime uh, is included in T, in, the, in this totally ordered subset. All right, so you, you have a, a bunch of uh, subspaces and you take the union of all these. So it means that the union is the biggest. And you have also linear functionals defined on those all Y primes. And so you, you define all L bar such that L bar of Y equals L prime of Y for Y in Y prime. So you can think more about it. So this course you need to focus, it's not, it's not easy, uh, but you can see this all works from the assumptions. Okay, then you can, you can check that L bar Y bar is an upper bound of T. So what do you have here? So now we have to say that we are in the conditions of application of Zorn's lemma. So from Zorn's lemma, it follows that S possesses a maximal element L plus Y plus. I, I recall that the Zorn's lemma states that if any totally ordered subset of S has an upper bound, then you can, you can show that you have that S has a maximal element. So now we apply that and 
we have we define the maximal element l plus y plus now we need to show that uh, we need to show that in fact y plus equals x so when we do that uh, we we will have our linear functional defined on x uh, now you have l plus which is defined on y plus and it satisfies all um, the, the, the conclusions of the theorem, but now we need to prove that in fact, y plus equals x. So let's us assume that that's not the case. Let us assume that's not the case. So if that's not the case, if y plus is not x, we can choose uh, some element, some point, x node which belongs to x but which not belongs to y plus and then you can define y prime prime as so you have this so you, you take you take one y in y plus and so so you, what you have fixed is x node now y and a vary in y plus and r And now we look for uh, L second, which is defined on Y second, such that L plus Y plus is less than L prime prime, Y prime prime. Okay, so, um, you know, so this y prime prime is bigger than y plus. It's strictly bigger under the assumption because you add this ax node. So y prime prime is strictly bigger than y plus. Okay, so if we construct such a l prime prime, uh, we'll get a contradiction because uh, y plus is supposed to be our maximal element. Okay, that being said, so we need that L second satisfy this inequality. So now so L second is linear. So here I can apply linearity. So I will get L second of y, but y y belongs to y plus. So instead of, of L second, I can write L plus plus a because l second is linear i can i can put the a outside and i get that then the right hand side doesn't change now uh i will split i will split um the uh this inequality i will split it in two uh depending on the sign of A. If A is positive, I rewrite this inequality as 1.1. And if A is negative, I rewrite this inequality as 1.2. So I, I don't do nothing. I just put the L plus Y on the right hand side and divide by A. 
So when A is positive, I get that. And when A is negative, I get that. Okay, now I will factorize 1.1. Because A is positive. A is positive, so, so I can put A in factor here because P of AX equals P AP of X when A is positive. So this one, I take this A outside. So strictly speaking, I should have here P of Y divided by A. And the same here, but since x is a is a is a vector space, so when a and y are uh, allowed to vary in r plus and y plus, uh, I can just uh, take out the a the a, and so uh, this thing. Uh, if I have this thing, then I have one point one, okay. So if I have 1.3, 1.3 implies 1.1, and 1.1 implies 1.3. Okay, uh, you can do the same. You can do the same for um, minus A. Why can I do that? Uh, again, the assumption is that P A of X equals A P of X for positive A. But now if A is negative, I can do it with minus A. All right, so I do exactly the same, but there's a minus here um, due to the minus A and I get that, okay? So you have to go, you have, you have to go through uh, this proof again. I'm just here, so you need to, you, you just can't stay here and, and lis listen to me, it's not sufficient. You have to reread that. This kind of this type of course, functional analysis, you, you, you need to work on it. But uh, what I say will help you. Okay. So now, um, so if I can find a value of, at L at X node, so a value L second at X node such that 1.3 and 1.4 is verified then i i can construct my l second so and 1.3 and 1.4 i can rewrite it like that all right all right so uh, just please uh note that here i i wrote y prime and here i wrote y because uh you have two inequalities and this has to be true for all y in y plus, okay? But if I can find this thing, then I'm good with my L second. So if this is true, then I can, I can, I can find my L second. And so now uh, what I'm doing here, you know, this one stays here. This one go on the left-hand side. Okay, maybe. Uh, maybe I can um, draw something here. Okay, so, uh, yeah. So what I was saying is that this one, I put it in there. Okay, and uh, this one, I put it in there. So you do the computations also. Okay, and I get that. So 1.6 comes from 1.5.
Okay, so the question is, oh, there's a typo here. Uh, there's a typo here, right? Okay, and, and, and now, note that. So y prime and y belong to y plus. So in y plus, I know that L plus is less than P. That's how I made the construction. So I know that this is true here, okay? And now I can just introduce minus X node plus X node. I did a new thing here and I can apply here the sub additivity. Okay. So what did I find? I found that uh, this is true. So if this is true, uh, then this is true. And so I can find such a L second. But then uh, I constructed a uh, I constructed an element that is bigger than my maximal element. And this is a contradiction, okay? So the point is that I cannot do that. This is false. This is false. And so if this is false, if this is false, that means that y plus equals x. So now I proved that L can be extended to all of x with L of x less than P of x. So next we have this uh, corollary one. So now, now uh, we oh, follow yeah. up with the question. It's it's linked with the the, the question. Uh, we have x, which is a normed space, and so now, uh, in the same way, you define L as a linear functional on the subspace, subspace y of x th such that, so now x is a normed space. So you have this norm, L of y is, um, is less than a constant c times the norm of y, but just in the subspace, not in the wall space. And then you can extend, you can extend L as a bounded linear functional such that uh, L of X is less than C of X. All right, so uh, next, uh, try to prove this. So I let you a few minutes <laughs> to prove uh, the corollary one. All right, so let's um, let's see the solution and the proof of corollary one. So it's an application of theorem one. We will apply theorem one with p of x equals c times the norm of x, right? Because now x is a normed space, so I have a norm. And uh, so, so I, what I need to show, I need to show that I can apply theorem one, meaning that the this function p satisfies the assumptions made 
for p in theorem one. So p of x plus y equals c times the norm of x plus y. So, but since it's a norm, no, norm of x plus y is less than norm the x plus norm of y. Uh, so I get that, but this is exactly p of x plus p of y. So p satisfies the sub additivity. And if I choose, if I pick up a positive number a, uh, that's also true because true because i is a is positive. So um, I got that. So then next I can apply uh, theorem one, and uh, so the uh, finally the conclusion is uh, this one is, is is from theorem one. Okay. All right, so next uh, we're moving and um, now we will consider um, linear space, but <coughs> over C, complex numbers. Okay, now I assume that X is a normal space, <clears throat> but the scalars are over C, you know? And so P is still a real non-negative function on X with the following properties. A P of AX, so here for all A in C and for all x in x, p of ax equals the modulus of a times p of x. And you have the subadivity uh, in the same way. Now, L uh, is no more a linear functional taking, functional taking values in R, but instead of R, it's in C. And so again, you assume that L is only defined on the linear subspace of X, uh, which is called Y. And you assume that the norm on C, the norm of L of Y is less than P of Y, all over this subspace Y. Then L can be extended to X as a linear functional dominated by P, meaning that you, are, you have the norm of L of X will be, uh, will be less than P of X for all X in X. So um, we are going to prove the proposition three. Uh, to do that, first, we define U as the real part of L. So L takes values in C, the, the set of the complex numbers. And so you, you define U as the real part of L. And you call V its imaginary part. So now uh, you, you have L of Y equals U of Y plus I. So I here is the complex number V of Y. So you can see, you can see that uh, if you define L as is because L is, uh, is linear. So you know that E equals L plus L bar uh, divided by two. So you can prove that U is a linear function too, but it's defined on Y. Okay, next, uh, of course, uh, the modulus of U, the norm of U in the, as a complex, as a, so, so it's a real number, but it's, it's, it's less than the modulus of L, right? Because the modulus of L is U square, U square 
plus v square, and you, you take the square root of that. But now, uh, of course, u is less than, than that, okay? So you got that u is less than the modulus of L, which is less than P by uh, definition of P. But now, <clears throat> so u is a linear function all defined on, on Y, and it satisfies, um, it satisfies the assumptions of uh, the theorem one. Okay, you can check that. So we apply uh, theorem one to u, and so it follows that you can extend u all over x uh, in such a way that u of x is less than p. So u is less than p. Okay, so we have, you, you, we now, what we did, we extended the, the, just the, lin, the real part of L. What we want is extend L, not just the real part of L. Okay, but now, you have this equality. So in fact, to define L, you can define it without V. You have L of Y equals U of Y minus I times U I Y. And why is that? Um, so, so L is a linear function. So this I, I can take it out. So when I take it out, I obtain L of I Y equals I L of Y. But now if I, if I, if I uh, do the computation, I L of Y. So if I multiply by I here, I got I U of Y. Um, so, so I times I is minus one. So I, I obtain that. All right. You just, it's an exercise, you have to do it. So uh, if, if I mu mu multiply by high here, here, I got this. You agree with me, right? It's a, it, it's a simple computation. All right. On the other hand, uh, L of I, Y by definition of L is U of I, Y plus I, V, I, I. This is the definition of L. So now I identify the real part in these two here and here. So the re real part here is, is, is this is re the real part. And this must, must be equal to that. Uh, that's it, you got V of Y, you got V of Y equals minus U I Y. So that's, that's what's written here. Okay. So uh, this equality holds. Okay, that, that's not bad, why? Because you, now is defined on all of X. So now I could define L with this e equation. Oh, that's actually what we do, all right? So now we can define L because U is defined all over X, not only on the subspace Y, but all over X. So now I define L all over X thanks to this equality. Okay, then again, you can prove it, it's a simple computation. Uh, I'm not going to do that. You have to do it. I did it, but uh, I'm not going to do, do it right now. It's, it's part of your job, do it. You can prove that L is linear. Just, just apply the definition of L. It's linear, you can prove it, okay? And also, uh, you can prove that uh, it's also, uh, easy computations uh, coming from 
the definition of L. So what we get, what we get, I left that, I leave that as an exercise for you. L is linear. So, and you have on X and you have L of X1 plus X2 equals L of X1 plus L of X2. So I've written there the, the part for uh, just the complex case. Um, so when you multiply by I, uh, thanks to this uh, computation now, um, uh, you 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 will you will uh, you will get that. All right. Uh, okay. Now. So what I have, what, what, what did I do? We define now, we, we have defined U L to the wall space, thanks to the definition of U. Uh, now it remains to uh, show that L is bounded. And so L is linear, those are computations. So the little, uh, which is a little bit tricky is to prove that L uh, satisfies satisfies uh, this inequality here. Okay, so now we, we we're dealing with that. Okay, so to do that, uh, we just so L is a complex number, so we can write it in 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 polar coordinates. So L of x equals I just write it as r e i theta which is equivalent to E minus I theta L equals R. Okay, now R is a real number. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So L is linear. So I can put this thing inside. So when I put it inside, I got that. But L is a real because this is equals to R. So this is real. So since it's a real, it's equal, it equals to U because U is a real part of L. Okay. Well, that, that, there's a typo here. I forgot. Okay. So now I just identify this thing with this thing, and I got that L of x equals e i theta. This is a typo. U e minus theta of x. So. I did the computation for you because often in the books uh, you did you don't find the computation you, you have to do it yourself so you can find it there. Uh, so you got that and now if you look at the uh, the the norm of L in the in C, so you get that. So from now from this you have this equality, but the norm of E, e theta in C is one, so you got that. And the, the norm of the real part in the set of complex numbers is less than um, uh, so now we 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 what we had this 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 sorry this um this comes from the fact that we prove uh, we prove the results already. Thanks to the Anbana theorem, we have this equality. We know that is that's true, okay. And uh, and and uh, and that's it. And why uh, this is? Yeah, you have equality there. Why? It's from the definition because you have that uh, p of uh, p of a complex number a times x equals the modulus of a times p of x. But the modulus of e minus i theta is one. So you got this result. <laughs> okay?